I'm Ben Bosma, and this is the briefing that I presented to the AUVSI Exponential Conference this year, 2023. Uh, I'm with Modern Technology Solutions Incorporated. We're a 100% employee-owned company with, I think, almost around 1,800 people now. These are our locations. We're all over the place. Mainly what we do is uh, we provide services uh, to our customer, our prime customer, our primary customer is the U.S. government. And here are some of the things we do. It's a lot. But today what I really want to talk about is one of the technologies that MTSI is developing uh, that we call Autonomous Air-to-Air -air Refueling, A3R. And that's a registered trademark. The basic concept of A3R is two things actually. One is to reverse the roles and I'll talk about how normal air refueling is done and then um, how we do it. But we reverse the roles of the tanker and the receiver making the tanker the more active player in the process. And then the other thing that we do is, is that instead of having a passive system between the tanker and the receiver, we have a very active agent that does a lot of the work, namely to connect the two platforms. So let's talk a little bit about air refueling. Uh, this is a picture from 1920 where a guy actually took a can, a jerry can of fuel, and uh, back in those days it was sort of a barnstorming time they would uh, get the airplanes close enough to each other and he would move between them. As far as I know, he wasn't wearing a parachute. Later, uh, in June 27th, 1923, uh, uh, near San Diego, a couple of de Havilland DH-4Bs uh, did uh, air refueling between the two. They had a 50-foot rubber hose. It was an empty hose. And they had uh, actually no gate valves at all between the two of them as it turns out they were just empty hoses and the one guy at the top would get a funnel and he'd pour gas into it and the guy in the bottom would have a funnel going into a tank and he would just let the the gas freely flow it's kind of hard to see but there's also a grounding uh, wire that is taped along this hose in this case here, the receiver was a guy by the name of Lowell Smith, and the hose catcher was Lieutenant John P. Richter. These are some good-looking guys, and that's the de Havilland right there behind him, give you an idea of the size of that aircraft. This is the uh, first tanker crew, and you can see there that it's a very simple setup. I took this picture because I needed to know how big the hose was. You get some idea of the of the mass and how the thing would fly. So uh, what I did is I took another, this is another view of that uh, 1923 air refueling and I did what's called photogrammetry, right? Where I measured the, we knew the length of the aircraft and that gave us an idea of the length of the hose and the distance between them. It turned out to be exactly what they said it was, which was 30 feet. Did a little math here and found out that they could transfer up to almost four gallons per minute. It's not a lot. And that was using gravity feed, assuming a 0.85 equation, which is the friction inside the line. And you know, you can actually, even though the pressure increases with head height, uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to get more flow. This is the challenge that we're looking at today. And you can see that I've overlaid a Cessna 208 Caravan and a uh, General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper over top of those two aircraft. And that, as you can see, they're marginally about the same size, okay? The Caravan's a lot bigger and the Reaper's a little bit bigger than the uh, DH-4. So what does that mean? So we uh, think that we can make pretty much any aircraft that has open access to their tanks air refuelable. And the way we do that is by taking a look at the 
filler tanks. In the case of the Reaper, there's a bunch of them, and I don't know how those tanks are interconnected, but at least we have access to some of the tanks, maybe all of the tanks, through the top. The Gray Eagle is like a Predator, uh, slightly different. It, it actually burns jet fuel, and it's used by the Army, and the Reaper, of course, is the uh, primary UAS armed or unarmed for the US Air Force and other countries there's a lot of those out there and you can see it also has a fuselage refilling tank and they're not the only aircraft pretty much every airplane ever built has an over-the-wing air refueling receptacle this is a Pilatus uh, we use them in the Air Force as a U-28 I think the Army may have some they're very limited as far as their endurance is concerned because they're not really designed to be a long endurance platform and we use them for a lot of different things but we could take this aircraft and make it air refuelable how do we do that well the main thing is is that what we do is we replace the filler cap with what i have called a blade it's basically a modified filler cap. It has a stand pipe, which is just a, an open pipe that, that comes up vertically from the filler cap. It's open. It does have a dust cover, so uh, you, know, you don't get stuff going into it or critters crawling into it. And then we put an aerodynamic shape around it so that it doesn't have too much drag. And also, it enables us to take a grip on it. You also notice that I stuck a decal on the wing. I'll talk about that later. Then what we do is we have that hose. Remember those two guys with the hose? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little flying machine on the end of that hose, and we're gonna let that flying machine use some enabling technology, which in this case is machine vision, sometimes called computer vision or robotic vision. It's very well understood. It's very easy to do. And what we're doing is, is we're taking that hose and we're converting it into a giant, long, skinny, very flexible robot arm. And this is a little quicker and more detailed view of that. As you can see, there we go. We go in there, we replace that thing with that blade. It's got an open hole on the top and there's also a vent in there. There is an overfill protection valve and it can be in here or it can be in the end effector. But in either case, it's not electronic. It's not anything special. It's that thing that we all have in our mitts when we're refueling our car. It protects the, uh, the operator from getting splashed all over with gas. And it protects the tanks in this case from uh, not only overfilling, but also overpressurizing. There's that decal. Let's talk a little bit about that decal. So this decal is, is, in this case, called an April tag. There are several different versions of them. They're called fiducials. And in this case, it's called a fractal tag, fiducial, or nested. What that means is, is that we have, in this case, three separate tags. And the reason we do that is, is I want to use a single camera. I don't want to get into uh, you know, high-tech optics. So what we'll do is we'll just have that tag uh, be nested so there's an outer tag and and two inner tags the way we uh, orient it is, is that in this case we always have a black box in the top right hand corner this particular tag is a very simple one but it actually can give us over a thousand different combinations to identify the aircraft which will then tell us what kind of fuel it takes how much it takes and uh, uh, you know maybe some other details that we keep in a database it's not that critical but it is critical to know which way is up and you can see we have that on all three of those tags if we want to know how far away we are from the aircraft modern uh, systems can do that by discerning the wingspan or the fuselage length, but then you got to know what the aircraft is. With a tag like this, what we do is we just make it a fixed width and height. It doesn't matter whether it's a square or not, as long as we know how tall it is and how wide it is. From that, what we do is we count the number of pixels in, in the camera, and, that, and then we do some simple math 
to determine how far away we are from the tag. And then by virtue of that, how far away we are from the aircraft. Craft. As we zoom in, and I'm not talking about optically zooming in, as we fly closer to the tag, we start picking up the inner tags, which are different, so that we know that their width is, what their width is, and how to get in closer and more tight. And that goes all the way into the inner tag. So we can go from, say, 200 feet away down to a few inches away using a single tag that's that's nested like this how about angles well for angles uh, we use another technology again it's fairly simple it's still using pixels but what we do is we look at the what's called the shear ratios between the edges that is is how far is the top edge from the bottom edge and the left right and those angles uh, for human beings this looks like a very three-dimensional picture right we're a little bit off to the right a little high but to a computer, it's two-dimensional, so it has to compute that. But again, those are all trivial uh, problems for even the smallest processor. And that gets us in there. And you can see that those edges are what we look for. This is what it looks like as we zoom in on these tags, right? The uh, camera just gets closer and closer and finally picks up that small. one and it, now it's real close what about that end effector well in this case here and they don't have to look like this but what I did very early and this has been happening over the course of the last five or six years that I've been developing this technology is this is an end effector that is broken down into your basic aircraft right it's a glider the wings are symmetrical. This thing does not need to generate a whole lot of lift. It does it with elevators, ailerons, rudder, and speed brakes. The speed brakes are actually split brakes that are in the um, ailerons, a lot like a B-2 bomber and, in, and uh, the A-10. Uh, those pontoons on the bottom are uh, can be thought of as a grip, and I'll talk about that a little later. So what it does is, is that as you approach the uh, filler cap, the blade, the cameras, which you can see on the wingtips here, actually uh, get it in close, but then it physically touches the top of the uh, blade, and there's a switch in there that says, hey, I just touched it, and like a Venus flytrap, it clamps on. That's the end effector. Let's talk about the tanker. In uh, this case here, what I'm showing is a graphic of a couple of aircraft that I'll talk about later uh, that can be used. One as a tanker and one as a receiver. They're, in this case, they're identical aircraft. Those are Merlins. They're uh, from a company called Aeromarine LSA down in Florida and uh, happen to have some of those. They're low cost. They're metal. They can be manned or unmanned and uh, are very uh, simple, low cost, easy to fly. Uh, this is a notional picture of what it would look like to refuel a Reaper class. It's got to go a little bit faster, but not too bad. In this case, we're using a Cirrus SR-22 uh, that's been retrofitted with a hose reel uh, and an end effector refueling an MQ-9. Uh, during the course of this work, uh, someone asked me to do some simulations, that is some CFD on this thing. I didn't have a whole lot of experience with it, but enough uh, to just be able to model the end effector and the wing. As you can see that the uh, filler cap doesn't do a whole lot to the aerodynamics. Uh, as we approach the, uh, the wing, uh, there isn't really a whole lot of effect. You can see that the end effector does uh, have a little bit of a bow wave on it. Uh, that you can see in red, but it's hard to read those numbers, but the, the pressure gradient here is grossly exaggerated. It's, it's in thousands of a PSI uh, pressure gradient as a consequence of that coming in. And then when the thing is completely hooked up, you can see here that it is 0 0.004 PSI pressure differential between the the leading edge of the wing in that red spot. Not a whole lot. 
and uh, certainly not a lot of interference between the two. I did uh, uh, run some flow analysis and this is what it looks like uh, for that wing. Uh, it's not really perturbed a whole lot by the end effector on top of it. And in this case here, the end effector is huge compared to the wing. Uh, in most of the cases that we're talking about, it's not quite, but it gives you an idea of the kind of scales we're talking about. What about uh, getting this thing in the air? Well, before we do that, just like anything else, what we want to do is uh, crawl, walk, run. In this case, that's what uh, we're looking at in real life, and this is all to scale on a 53-foot uh, 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 trailer you can see the uh, top Merlin and the bottom Merlin that's to scale and uh, but we we're not going to be bolting airplanes to a, uh, a boom like that we'll just do it without and uh, and see if we can't create a wind tunnel this isn't the first time somebody has used a trailer or a truck and driven down the road or a runway or a desert in order to simulate a wind tunnel uh, that's one version of it. This is one that's a little more practical. Uh, my truck, my trailer, my wife's van, and uh, a uh, hose reel at the top to do some testing. Uh, the main thing here is, is to see how it works. It's a slightly different end effector in this picture. It's uh, a delta shape. And it doesn't really matter what the shape is. What we're trying to do is we're trying to maneuver that gripper or whatever uh, uh, device we have at the bottom of it in order to get a contact. Uh, the Merlins, which is what uh, we have uh, in order to do this, these are all privately owned, are experimental amateur built. And because they're experimental amateur built, there's a lot of things you can do, especially when it comes to testing. So uh, they also resemble one of the platforms that's a target platform, the Pipstrel Cinnas, which has been uh, converted into a UAS by several uh, players, including myself. And uh, this, it, it basically operates at the same air speeds, altitudes, uh, you know, like that. The big difference is that the uh, Pipistrel Sinus is substantially more expensive than a Merlin PSA, as you can see here. And these are current prices. Uh, to do it and much simpler to put together. It's an all-metal aircraft, very easy, easy to certify. There's a bunch of them out there. Uh, this is a picture of one that that uh, I have. It's uh, a Merlin on floats, and if you can visualize all of the tanker uh, geometry at the back end of the floats. That's where we would put the end effector. We would have the hose reel in the cargo compartment. As you can see, there's already a hole in the bottom of this thing uh, that was used for another purpose. And, and even though there's not an engine in it, we have several engines and I'm considering putting in my hybrid electric uh, engine in that one. Uh, this is a hangar. There's actually four aircraft in this picture. Uh, the, there's three Merlins and, an, uh, and a Luscombe back there. And as you can see, they're not very big, very easy to build, and very easy to fly, maintain, and, and to convert into an autonomous platform. So that's if we go into flight testing. And what I wanted to show you here was this is what flight testing would look like with the yellow Merlin and uh, another one in there. The um, picture on the left was uh, taken in 1928. This is a slightly different version of a very similar test. And you can see it's the same thing. This is my garage. That's what the Merlin looks like in my garage. You can see that it's it's not that big. And you can also see what the nested tag looks like on the wing. It, it pretty much dominates it. But as you can see, a camera would find it easily. Uh, one of the things people said was, hey, you know, if you put that hose out there, it's going to drag straight back, hit the tail. So this is a, a test that we did. You can see uh, as he lowers the pod that it basically goes straight down. A little bit of a glitch. That pod weighed 20 pounds and it does not get even close to the tail. Basically a, a, a very good demonstration of how if you have a weighted hose, it's not going to trail very close to the tail. Um, I made 
made a video here, an animation. It's a little bit off, mainly because I didn't model the hose properly because I don't have, I didn't turn on the winds on the hose, so it doesn't uh, billow the way it normally would, but it, you can kind of see, get the idea of what this whole process is. The uh, aircraft in the back is autonomous, the aircraft in the front is autonomous, and the end effector is autonomous. You can see that it's, it's a little tight, and that's again because I didn't, uh, turn on the winds. It takes a long time for these to render. I'll, I'll see if I can't tweak myself. I'm not a uh, animator, uh, so this is a rather amateurish, amateurish uh, video, but it's uh, the best I could cobble together in the limited amount of time that I have. And as you can see, as soon as it's done refueling, it automatically uh, disengages all that stuff is 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 automatic and it perches back on to its uh, a position on the tanker where it can be recharged and uh, and and stuff like that there's there's all kind of stuff that's that's just further further engineering all right so uh, basically let's talk about what we're doing here we've got the tanker now be taking the active role in theory we could have a uh, a UAS and be able to refuel it while it's in the cap. And that was the original intention. We never got that far, mainly because uh, the program uh, sort of shifted directions, went to another, um, you know, uh, party to, to manage and uh, no longer became part of AFRL's effort. Uh, so we never got to that point. However, um, there's growing interest uh, in being able to refuel a UAS primarily in the Pacific Theater for obvious reasons. The distances are huge. Uh, as a matter of fact, in that lower right hand corner, uh, that's me uh, flying a Lear 35 jet uh, and uh, watching a, in this case here, an MV-22, the Marine Corps version of the CV-22, uh, getting refueled by probe and drogue behind a KC-46. Uh, we're about 100 miles uh, off the coast of California, very low altitude, 55,000 pounds. And if you could hear uh, what was going on there, I am on the stall horn in that Learjet. It's one of my additional duties is to fly chase out at Edwards. But there's more, okay? This particular invention, which is the basically to be able to maneuver a hose using a flying machine at the end of it uh, had a lot of different what we call embodiments. Um, when I first started looking at this, I envisioned a glider at the end of the hose. But when we filed for a patent, which goes back all the way to 2016 when we first filed this, we added a bunch of what's called subject matter. That is other embodiments, other possibilities for a slender hose to be able to be maneuvered. And it doesn't have to be a hose. It can be a tether. It can be a helicopter hoist. It can be a data cable. It can even be in space. And then the end effector in the an original patent application, uh, the claims that is, even though the the descriptions were in the all of the descriptions for all those things I just talked about were in the original patent application. However, we only claimed air refueling between two airplanes and transferring fuel between them with a glider end effector. But in that application, I described an end effector that can be moved with aerodynamic forces, rockets, jets, or propellers. In other words, it doesn't have to be a glider on the end there. So we show here in this picture several other embodiments, including a UAV catch and release system, which you may have seen, the ability for us to move a, a, a helicopter hoist into a cave or an apartment, a, uh, we call that cliffside rescue, the ability to uh, stabilize a helicopter hoist was described in that 2016 patent application. Uh, how about uh, anchoring, anchoring the tether 
on the ground, maneuvering it, and then anchoring it on the ground and then going into an orbit. What happens is uh, that when you do that, the energy kind of bleeds off the end of the, the hoist cable and it, it sits stationary. And you can actually uh, grab that thing and we've done that uh, in flight test already. It's pretty impressive. And so this particular uh, technology, we'll call it, it has the ability to just simply move a hose or a tether or a hoist or a, uh, a even a steel cable for refueling or resupplying submarines out at sea uh, by being able to actively move the end of the tether. We can do it in space, we can do it over water, and we can even use it to pick up downed airmen using fighter aircraft. So that's uh, basically my briefing. I've added uh, a, uh, a poster and a link here if you want to scan that. Uh, you can download the poster which describes a lot of this stuff. And uh, I'm happy to answer any of your questions as part of that poster. There's my contact information, phone number, and stuff like that.